Good afternoon. I welcome you all to this message from Jubilee Ministries. Uh, my name is Robert Pilgrim, for those of you who don't know. And I've been doing this for a long time, and I never have gotten over the excitement of it, and I never have gotten over the trepidation that comes along with it. It's just part of it. We talked last week on paradoxes, and I, I, I know this is a, an odd way for me to go because, you know, most of you like to hear me preach live when I preach like my coattails on fire. And I do want to make a suggestion to all of you. If you will uh, join our class we have on Thursday nights, it starts at 730 sharp. Uh, Eastern time. We get in about 7.15. We visit a while. If you're new, we'll introduce you around everyone. And it is perhaps one of the most phenomenal things I've ever seen outside of a live uh, service in a real revival. And it is overflowing. That's all I can say. It's just overflowing with the goodness of the Lord. And I want to invite all of you to join us on Thursday nights. We will be getting back to our Tuesday night class. I'm just kind of letting summer pass. And I know most of you are so tired. It's been so hot this summer. I didn't want to crowd you. And I want to let my old tired body rest just a little bit. I am next Sunday... Uh, actually, the first Sunday of, of August, don't forget, we have communion on every first Sunday. And on that morning, I may well do something that I just like to do. I will have been saved 37 years at that point. I know that sounds funny to most of you. You don't remember when you were saved, the date or anything like that. But it's a very special thing to me. And so... Uh, we'll probably, I may be talking about that some, I don't know. I'm just really glad to be saved. I've been listening to some old music this morning and worshiping and praising. And I'd originally intended to, to leave this alone and go on and, uh, and start talking about my favorite, uh, subject for the church world, which is revival, but I'm not going to do that today. We're going to go back to the paradoxes of the Bible. We'll call this part two. And we said last week, um, well, we'll just wait a minute. We won't get there. I've got several things that are really important. I have a young uh, a man that I led to the Lord of over 30 years ago. His name's Ira Miles. And they have diagnosed him with cancer for the second time. God healed him the first time, not expecting anything less. But I need your prayers. Ira's a good bit older now. He's pushing about 80, I would suppose. And the Lord helped me to lead him to, to Jesus in, in a revival in McGee, Mississippi, of all places. And then he helped me to introduce him to his wife. And she's one of my favorite people. And I just want you to be praying for her as well. Her name is Mary. And I want you to keep praying for my elder, George Gentry, and his wife, Linda. He's doing better. Therefore, she's doing better. But we're looking for a miracle. And I want to continue to pray for Miss Carr up the street from us who has cancer. And I heard something last night. Lori said I heard it once before, but I didn't remember it. I spoke with Edith Ann's dad last night, and um, he had her in his arms, and he put the phone to her. She was just gurgling and, and, and yapping like a one-year-old will do, and um, caught my soul on fire. I realized that um, all the hours of prayer and all the tears and all the pleading with the Lord for that baby. And here she is a year later and a year ago, they were trying to give her a liver transplant and they still try to talk about it. But I just know that Jesus has got that thing worked out and it blessed me down in the depths of my soul just to hear that baby gurgle. And you know, I'm not a big baby person, but uh, it, it did me good. <clears throat> And so in just a moment, you go ahead and turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians 4, and uh, we'll go from there with our paradoxes. We're going to continue on uh, with a few of these and uh, just a few little extra notes that I put in uh, that I, I want to talk about uh, that the Lord put on my heart. 
We, I just got to tell you, if you're not taking that class on Thursday, you're missing something. And I just, that's all I know to say. I'm not going to beg you to come to class any more than I'm going to beg you to give or beg you to pray. I don't believe in all that. I do need you to pray. I, I told you that we're taking on a new project that will require some extra money. We've just finished our two projects. Uh, well, we haven't quite finished praying for them for our elderly people we were helping. And we've got a new project coming that is going to run us about an extra thousand a month. So I need you to help me with that. And uh, you always have been faithful. I don't have to beg you for anything. And um, I just pray for me. I, I've been out quite a bit of expense on my automobile. The good news is we had the money to pray to pay with. And the um, but it, it did kind of deplete us a little bit. So you pray for us. We took a good hard lick there. So I don't know anything to do, but be real honest. I did this when I pastored. I did it as an evangelist. I just don't play around. I do want to thank some of you that I've already seen you uh, increase your giving a little bit. Need all of you who are faithful to this ministry and to uh, to just up it a little bit, especially for the next year. And uh, and so thank you. You always have been gracious and faithful, and I love you. And uh, I just wanted to just ask you, please pray for Ira. Please pray for George. And of course, always Shirley and my mom and Becky. That That's just, you know, goes without saying they are my heart. And uh, I'm very pleased. And I want to tell you, I'm not going to go into what, but this week I had three blessings to fall into my lap in a six-day period. And all I could do was sit and think I'm being overtaken with blessings. Now, you that know me know for many years, it, it was just like every day was a miracle and every day was just ultimate provision and healings and anointings. And then when I got so sick, I got to the point that I, I wondered. And this scripture I'm going to read in a moment is one of the ones that helped me get through. And I wondered at times if I would even make it. And I continued on with this matter of paradoxes this morning because of something was said to me. A young man from St. Louis asked me a question and a pastor friend of mine, Rodney Lewis, made a comment this week. And uh, I said it last week. Uh, and, and then I got a, a text this morning from another fine young lady talking about you know, how we all want this order in our lives and we want one plus one to equal two. And Sometimes one plus one equals 187 and you don't even know how you got there and what happened. And I followed the rules and I did this and wow, sometimes it just doesn't add up. And like we said, the gospel is a story of paradoxes and we're going to cover a few more of them today. Father God, I want to thank you for that little gurgle I heard last night from Edith Ann, that, that's because of you, Jesus, that that baby is able to laugh and play. And they said she's been taking a bottle, which is something she couldn't do a whole lot of. And I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for strengthening George and him doing better and getting a better report. I want to thank you for the joy I heard the lilt in Linda's voice. I need you to touch my friend Ira Miles. He's one of my babies. And I want you to heal him of this cancer. And Lord, I would that everyone that listens to these messages would take on the burden of praying for Ira and Miss Carr and always for Shirley and my mom and Lori's dad and never forget all the caregivers. Oh, God, touch the caregivers and touch my young and Becky, Lord, and make her strong. Don't let her be a vacillator. Let her plant her feet and say, I am healed. Hallelujah. I want you to touch Jennifer this morning. She's struggling physically. I want you to make her whole. Most of all, I want the anointing that makes preaching easy and effective. And Lord, I'm ready to be overtaken with blessings. You daily loaded us with benefits. And I want to thank you for everything you did this week. Thank you for everything you're going to do this next one. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the, give us the anointing that makes preaching easy and effective. 
We'll give you all the praise. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter four. Uh, it won't hurt to back up to verse 16. Second Corinthians four. And here we go. For which cause we faint not. We faint not. That word means to implode, to cave in on yourself. For though our outward man perisheth, yes, he does. Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. And though my body has been through some very severe collapses through the years, my inner man was strengthened day by day. One of the most miraculous things I can tell you is even in my blackest hour, the Lord was able to keep me in the word and keep me in prayer. And this verse here ministered to me particularly yet another that I'll quote just because I want to. Uh, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. There was all the pain, all the struggle, all the troubles you're going through, Shirley, but for a moment. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. One of my pastors, young pastors, one of my babies, asked me when I was the sickest and I was just having to almost be carried to the pulpit if I went. And he asked me, he was torn up. He said, what do you know? What do you know that we don't know? I said, I know it's temporary. He said, how do you know? I said, because I can see it. And while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are not seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen, the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Seeing the unseen, what a paradox. I would imagine if a person were coming out of the deepest part of Africa or the backwoods of India or China, perhaps, and they were to see a scientist looking through a microscope, I can't imagine how weird that might seem to them when they would look at it in the natural and say, there's nothing on there, but yet we know that it is covered in living organisms. And so we, we, we understand that a, a paradox, we'll go back over it, it is defined as a tenet or a proposition contrary to received opinion and seemingly absurd, but true. It's when it just doesn't make any sense. And, and I go to this matter of, uh, let, let's go over to Hebrews 11, just a second, if you don't mind with me. You don't mind running over there with me. I'm going to take my time a little while this morning and not feel rushed and <clears throat> not feel like I'm, I'm in a performance mode. I never have liked that. And um, Hebrews 11, 27 by faith, talking about Moses, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. The apostle Paul told the Colossians he was an invisible God. He wrote Timothy and said he is an invisible God. And yet we know that Jesus is the perfect representation of the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And I have had to learn with my brother Moses of old. <clears throat> I couldn't help but think about old Moses because when he was 40, for 40 years, he'd been trained to rule Egypt. For 40 years, he'd been educated in the finest schools. For 40 years, he had applied himself to the wisdom. He was an astrological genius, perhaps had great knowledge of medical things, we believe. And Moses, I, I love Moses. He, um, one of the things I love about Moses is uh, he was a human being. And I, I was reading that in that 11th chapter of Exodus this morning, just went back to refresh my mind. And it said when he came into Pharaoh after nine, after nine plagues, and Pharaoh scolds him and says, don't you ever, at the end of the 10th chapter, don't you ever come back in my presence again. He said, if you do, you're going to die. And I love it. It said Moses got angry. Now, you know, I was reading this morning, and I don't admonish anger, but uh, he had what we call in the church, we love this, righteous indignation. And Moses was, uh, he got hot. 
Now, he got hot earlier in life and it cost him 40 years on the backside of the desert. Wouldn't you like to know what your burst of anger have cost you? Wouldn't you like to know for your outburst and your blowups what they've cost you? I don't think we'd want to pay that price over again. And so I look at Moses. Excuse me, I didn't mean to get rid of that. I had something written on that. I, I look at Moses and it says he endured by seeing him who is invisible. Let's look what he endured. Well, at 40, at what we would say the prime of life, they threw him away. And he went on the backside of the desert where he knew nothing about. He had lived a life of comfort in the palace. He knew all about protocol. He knew how to deal with whomever needed dealing with. But he didn't know what a scorpion was. And he didn't know what a cobra would do to him. And he didn't know how hard the desert could be. And in the desert, he was dry. And may I remind you that the three major religions of the world, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, all were desert religions. And so there's something, may I, I just, since you brought it up, you know, Jesus was in the wilderness and, and that's where he attained what he needed. Luke 4 and 1 says he went in full of the Holy Ghost. Luke 4 and 18 said he came out in the power of the Holy Ghost. And so for many of you today, when life's not making sense and it looks like things are just all upside down and turned around. And as, as my friend Pastor Lewis said to me this week, he said, look at what you've been through and it don't have any rhyme or reason. That's an old Southern colloquialism, no rhyme or reason. And I look at Moses and 40, he's okay. But when his 50th birthday rolled around and he's forgotten, and in the middle of nowhere, nobody speaks his name much in Egypt anymore. And he's on the backside of the desert. I, um, I understand. And then when 60 rolled around, he started telling God how old he was, I'm sure. And the Lord just smiled. And... Seventy rolled around, and eighty rolled around. Most theologians believe that Moses had an inkling as a young man of what was to come. That's why he jumped up and killed the Egyptian that was beating one of his brothers. He was knew that he was a deliverer or the deliverer, God being the ultimate deliverer, but Moses being the man. Greatest thing about Moses, not the fact he trusted God. The greatest thing about Moses is God trusted him. So how did he make it? How did he make it through his 60th birthday, 50th birthday, 70th birthday, 80th birthday? How about all them blowing sandstorms and scorpions and cobras and dying sheep and enemies attacking and stealing and and and, and all he's got is, is he's out in the middle of Midian where he doesn't even know those people until now he's become one of them and all of a sudden the Bible said he heard on or he he, he he something disrupted up on the mount at Sinai and he said he turned aside from the tending of sheep and he went up into the mountain. You know the story of the burning bush. And he saw him who is invisible. And all of a sudden, things started making sense. And all of a sudden, after 40 years of silence, at least, God started talking again. When you've been through a long, quiet spell with God, it's hard to bear sometimes. When you've been through a spell when the word looks like it was written in Chinese and you can't get anything out of it, <laughs> and everybody around you is acting crazy, and your husband's crazy, and your wife's crazy, and your young'uns are crazy, and your boss is insane, and your neighbors lose their mind, and then you hear your name called. I love it. Moses. I can't imagine what that must have felt like. He must have thought, my God, yes, it is me. I'm here. And he called him in close and he gave him his marching orders. Scripture says Moses was eloquent in speech, but Moses didn't think so. Another paradox. 
And he left there and he went back to Egypt. He delivers the word of the Lord and they took their straw away from him and things got worse and the elders were angry. And they couldn't even receive a good word. And I'm afraid some people get today where they get so low to even a word of encouragement sounds silly to them. But Moses endured as seeing him who is invisible. Seeing, not one time, but progressively lifting up his eye to a higher plane. Progressively staying focused on the Lord. Progressively <coughs> following when it didn't make any sense. Progressively going on one plague to another, one plague to another, enduring, enduring, being laughed at, told not to go. I read last night, A.B. Simpson said the devil tried to bribe Moses with the riches of Egypt. I thought, what a thought. He offered him the ultimate bribe, bribe. You can rule the world. But you know, there are very few people that remember who the Pharaoh was at the time of Moses. We say Ramses because of the movie we all grew up watching, but perhaps not. <clears throat> but here we are now thousands of years later and we're still talking about Moses and his name is lasted a long time. It's in the Bible more than 1200 times. There's nobody other than God that's mentioned more, but what a paradox. How do you see what you can't see preacher? Well, by faith, for we walk by faith and not by sight. And Moses knew when he, walked, when he left Midian, he knew Israel was a free people. You've got to be able to do what God said in Romans 4 and, see, and do like God. And, and the Bible said he sees the end before the beginning. That's the faith. Literally, literally, if I were to sum up my definition of faith is knowing what God knows. And I do know a little of it, but not much. I need greater faith. I need greater insight. And I, I look at Moses seeing him who is invisible, seeing him who is invisible. And uh, you see, once you focus on him, you don't see the storms, you don't see the haters, you don't see the toxic people, you don't see the problems. Once you really lock in on him and keep on locking in and keep on seeing him, you see him who is invisible. And I love what he told Pharaoh when he walked out that day. He said, in a minute, everything in Egypt's going to be crying and weeping. And he said, but there's not even a dog. I love it. One translation said, there's not even a dog going to lick anybody in Israel. One translation said there'll be no dogs to bark, none will snarl. You're talking about God having complete control of things. He said the night that all your pain comes, he said, will be the night of our deliverance. For we have seen him who is invisible. I can't help but wonder how many times during that exodus. We know he saw him on Mount Sinai for he was hid in the cleft of a rock and he went by, but he kept his eyes on him that is invisible. He kept looking at him who is invisible. And then I, I couldn't help but just going on. Bear with me. I, I'll try to move as quickly as I can. <clears throat> Bible said that not only do we endure by seeing what can't be seen. I know that's what got John through. John got through on the Isle of Patmos with that. And I could go through the scriptures and stay 40 days and nights on this, but I won't. And uh, then we go over to Matthew 5 and, uh, and verse 5. And we read these words. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness is not weakness. And we conquer by yielding. And then Romans 12 and Verses 20 and 21, we know, let's just go there and read together. We'll take our time. We're going to slow down this morning with taste. Romans 12 and 20 and 21. 
He said, therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap hot coals, a fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. What another paradox. My goodness. You mean I'm going to be victorious by surrendering? Yes. You mean I'm going to win by controlling? You mean I can't scream and yell and jump up and down and act the fool I've been acting all my life every time I don't get my way? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And you got to go back to the word. What Jesus say? <clears throat> Bless them that curse you. Pray for them that despitefully use you. If they ask for one coat, offer them two. If they want you to go the extra mile, if they ask you to go one mile, go two. Return good for evil. By doing so, you heap hot coals upon them. And no, that doesn't mean like dashing a pot of hot grits on them, ladies. What it means is by your behavior, it will light the altar of incense, which is worship unto God. And he will be glorified and he will be magnified. And a sweet aroma will ascend under the throne. It is the paradox of human nature to love your enemies. Nobody wants to love their enemies. Nobody wants to be good to mean people. But we have to go. And I, I've learned that I have to keep applying the love no matter how much pain they keep applying. And Lord, it seems like I get to practice this one a lot. Sometimes I wonder, what do I do to make people be so mean to me? It seems to come pretty easy to them. But I've had to keep on loving. I've had to keep on praying. If I hadn't, I wouldn't be celebrating another spiritual birthday in a couple of days. And then another paradox. We rest under a yoke, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn. Uh-oh. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek. There's that word again. It's an equestrian term. It means power under control. For I am meek and lowly in heart. Now, you know, we see a little of this in Jesus with Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate says, you know, I have the power to do this, that, and the other. Jesus said, you've got squat. He said, you've got nothing. He said, all only thing you got is what my father has allowed, and he's going to rule this thing, and then Jesus went on and said, I'm lowly in heart. You should find rest. Say that I need rest for my brain. Your soul is your psyche. I need rest for my thinking patterns. I'm tired of trying to figure it all out. I'm exhausted from trying to come up with a plan. And how am I going to pay for it? How am I going this? And how am I going that? You're not. So what do you learn? We rest under a yoke. Sounds like one of the biggest paradoxes I've ever heard. A yoke is for work. A yoke is for hard work, hot work. I told a young couple yesterday, they were talking about they were working out in the heat and working hard. I said, let me tell you something. Hard work in the heat will make your marriage real good. I said, because you'll vex each other enough. I said, you'll grind those sharp edges off where everybody else can stand to be around you. When you go out in a field, I actually have plowed before. When I was young, my daddy thought I need to learn to plow. So I did. I didn't do very good at it, but I did plow a little. But I know a little about a yoke. I know a little about what a Hames is. Most of you don't know that. And I learned that yokes are adjustable. I've told you this 50 times. One more won't hurt. A yoke is adjustable. There was a man I read of once that said he had a great big ox and said, but he just would not plow by himself. So he was excellent, kept the row straight, everything. But he had a little friend that was a little small, what we call a coon hunting you in the South, a little small donkey. And said, if you put that donkey in with him, said he would do everything. And you could adjust the yoke so that it wasn't half on the donkey and half on the ox. You know, Jesus is our burden bearer. And the yoke is adjustable. And all the ox wanted was the friendship and the communion from the little donkey. Little donkey just be pushing, thought he was really plowing that field, doing his job. But all he was really doing is walking alongside. 
one time when my puppy was a baby, I was wrestling with him one night. He used to come get me every night at nine o'clock and come and put the phone down, basically, <clears throat> pet me. So he and I would get the floor and wrestle and fight. And a friend of mine called me one night, Chip Rice, and he, he, he was just tore up. I could tell we were talking. He, I said, what's wrong? He said, you and that dog. I said, what about him? He said, well, y'all just wrestling and he's growling and fussing. And he thinks he's doing a big job and giving you all you can handle. He said, and all the time you could end the fight with one move. And I said, yeah. He said, you know, that's the way it is with us and the Lord. We really think we're doing good, but all the time, you know, it takes one move of his hand to fix the situation. So I've had to learn to rest under a yoke. I used to fret some, used to worry some, but I've had to learn to quit it. I've learned that the best thing I can do is be in communion with him. I've learned that the best thing I can do is talk to him and tell him every detail of my life. And when I'm scared, I tell him. And when I'm vexed, I tell him. And when I'm angry, I tell him. And when I'm struggling with the temptation, I tell him. I've reached a place that when temptation comes to me, I usually am embarrassed because I just believe it means the devil has seen a chink in my armor and is trying to poke a hole through it and I want to stop up all the holes. <clears throat> just remember, communion is really what he wants. Remember, I told you he chose the 12 that they might be with him and he chose them after an all-night prayer meeting. And uh, if unrest has disturbed your rest and chaos has disturbed your peace, replaced your peace, and depression has replaced your joy, you are probably not yoked up correctly. You may be unequally yoked in life even. And here we are to be yoked, communion. What does that mean, Pastor? Well, it means to cast all of your cares upon him. It literally means take them all and roll them up in a ball and throw them over on him. To rest under a yoke. That which shows to be for work and learn. Whoever learned much out in the field, Apparently, a lot of folks, if we're communing with the right person while we're walking. And then we know that um, Matthew chapter 18, go over there. We become great by becoming small. My goodness. Isn't all this so backwards? And, and see, this is where you get in trouble. You're trying to use uh, the logic of the hour and... Uh, <clears throat> Jesus said in Matthew 18, verse 4, whosoever shall humble himself as this little child, the same, the same, is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I want you to listen. If you don't ever get anything else I say, get this. There is a big difference between being childish and childlike. Childish behavior is what most of you exude every time things don't go your way. And you think if you fret and scream and holler or get depressed or sit around and pout, somebody will take notice and give you what you want. And I don't feel good. And I, 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 I. that's childishness. Childlikeness is saying, my father owns cattle on a thousand hills. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The silver is mine, the gold is mine. Say it the Lord, why would I be worried about money? Why would I be fretting when it says, with his stripes, I am healed? I've learned in a very childlike manner, and I had one of those episodes last night with him. I just went in and shut the door and got on my face before him. I said, I, I kind of need to come to this place tonight, Father. This is where you and I commune and meet. And I don't want to be depressed. I don't want to be beat up. I, I want to be small. I want to be small in my own eyes. I've always prayed that from the start. The Bible said when Saul was small in his own eyes, God raised him up. And so, <clears throat> you see, I don't want to be childish. We've seen enough childish behavior. What I want to be is his child. I had a young man come to do some work for me yesterday and I told him when he left, I said, you're an impressive young man. I said, you don't know me well enough though, but I think I'll just adopt you. And most of you know what that means. And he said, I like that. I said, good, good. 
So I don't want to fret about things. I want to be a childlike surrender. My daddy's bigger than your daddy. My daddy can do anything. My father is capable of doing all I have to do is surrender everything to the love of my father, knowing that he always has my best interest. My good and his glory is the only way he works, and he is God is love, and he cannot operate outside of love, but he also cannot operate outside of light. And so sometimes the light comes on in my life and it reveals areas that I'm not being very childlike about. I'm being childish about. And I have to catch myself and I want to fret and cry and jump up and down and accuse him of child abuse or neglect and all those things. And you see, he's trying to do something in you, but most of all, he's trying to get all that foolishness and that anger out of you. And Bible said anger rested in the bosom of a fool. So there's that. <clears throat> then we know that we reign by serving. And how does that work? Well, Matthew chapter 10, he said, who that would become the greatest must become the servant. And I'm amazed and appalled at how little servanthood there is. And I'm amazed and, and wowed by how easy it comes to those of us who are servants. I remember once preaching a, a, a big meeting and they had spotlights on me when I walked out and I stopped. I said, excuse me, Mr. Lightman, would you turn the house lights on? I said, um, would you turn the house lights on and, and take the spotlight off me? I am a servant. I am not a star. He is the bright morning star. He'll do all the shining. And I've quoted it so many times, it certainly can't hurt here today. The old prayer of Ruth Calkin. Ruth Calkin was a great woman speaker. And she said, oh, Lord, how I love to minister to the multitudes. How I love the anointing that comes and the excitement of watching their faces shine. She said, but I must be honest and ask myself, would I be just as inspired if the job you gave me to do <clears throat> was to wash the body of one little old lady in a room every day where nobody ever knew but you and I and her, would I be just as inspired? What about your servanthood? Does it come natural? Does it come easy? You know, I, I'm going to say it to you. Servanthood is training for reigning. Bible said if we, if, if we serve him, we'll reign with him. If we suffer with him, we'll reign with him. That all is so paradoxical. And so when I, I see people, I've, I've seen people when we were in churches be coming in in the evenings for the service and have our arms loaded down with things to bring and then sit and watch. Didn't even offer to open the door, much less say, Pastor, let me get that for you. Let us get take that out of your hand. No servanthood whatsoever. It doesn't come natural to people because they want to be the ruler. They want to be the deacon. They want to be the pastor, the song leader, whatever else. It doesn't come easy. And I, I'll tell you another paradox is giving and this part of this. Giving when your money's tight, I'll tell you something. Anybody can give when you got both pockets full, but when that money gets thin and, and the first thing you hear in the back of your mind is you could slip them ties this week. I'm reminded two little stories. My grandmother said her ties were six cents one time. And she told the Lord, I'm just too broke. I'll make them, I'll pay them next week. She said, now I'm not saying God did it or had anything to do with it. She said, when I came home from church, my milk cow was dead. I never missed my tithes again. My friend Harold Wall said his tithes were a few dollars one time and said he'd failed to pay them that day and said he had three flats the next week. Said he got them tithes paid pretty quick. I don't believe in legalism. And you that are, are, want to get all legalistic about giving, you go ahead. You're being silly. Those of us who are givers, we know what this means. We know that Bible said, how can you pass by your brother in need and shut up the bowels of compassion and say the love of God dwell within you? It's not a tithe. I just use that word because it's a biblical word. Really, it just boils down to giving. And like I said, it's a paradox. How you can make it further on 90% than you can on 100, I don't know, but I will assure you that it works. I can assure you that the more you give, the further your money will go and you'll look up one day and have money in the bank and not wonder where it came from. And all the time you realize I was laughing about having to spend so much money on my car and I've been out a vast amount this last year. First dime I've spent on it in 15 years. That's pretty good. 
and everything needs his nose wiped once in a while. And so servanthood rests for our souls under a yoke. Reigning, Jesus gave the ultimate example of what? Foot washing. Lord, that's a left out thing in the church today. Foot washing. My papers are sticking here, children. Just bear with me. And, and I don't have very good hands. So let's just pray for the preacher. That'll come apart in a minute, I suppose. There we go. And so we start where we reign by serving. We're humbled. Whosoever, Matthew 23 and 12, whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Paradox. Then we become wise by being foolish. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 20, 21. God made the foolishness of the world, the foolishness, made foolishness to be the wisdom of God, and it pleased him through the foolishness of preaching, the foolishness of preaching. God's wisdom will always be first peaceable. It always won't start a fight. That's why I can always tell when anybody wants to give me a piece of their mind, they're not about to give me the wisdom of God. They're about to give me a piece of their mind. And I want to tell them, baby, it's pretty small to begin with. You might want to keep those pieces. But you see, we must let everyone know that you become wise by being foolish. You become strong by being weak. You have more by giving more. You rest under a yoke. You learn under a yoke. And it's foolishness. Foolishness. And I have attained some modicum of wisdom through the years, but it's because I'm so dependent. You all laugh at me because I come on so strong. But I'm a needy child. I'm a desperately needy child. And when it comes to wisdom, I tell him every day, I said, do I know enough to defend the gospel? Do I know enough to stand and and he always seems to give me what I need that day. And then I got to move quickly, but we'll come free by being slaves. Romans 6, 17 through 22 and Romans 8 and 2 says we are freed from the law of sin and death. And we are servants unto righteousness. Oh, my goodness. We have been servants unto uncleanness and iniquity. But now we yield ourselves unto righteousness and to become servants unto righteous unto holiness. It's a yielding. It's a surrender. It's not a, I quit this or I quit that. I never quit narcotics. I surrendered. I gave up. I never quit women. No, I just surrendered and knew that it was wrong. And I had people ask me when I first got saved, how'd you come out of that world and leave women alone? I said, because I prayed early on. You may laugh at me. I prayed early on and I said, Lord, you know, I got saved the summertime. And when I came out in the South, that didn't mean a whole lot of clothes. And I knew that was going to be a problem immediately. And I asked the Lord, I said, how do I keep from blowing this and messing it up? And I prayed, Lord, make them all look like trees. And I got to the point that, yes, I can still see a beautiful woman now, but they don't doesn't face me. I've got one at home. I don't need another one. I've got the best one going. And I've been set free. Did you ever notice the Apostle Paul always called himself a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, never a prisoner of the Roman Empire? And you see, if I'm free, if I've been set free, like Jesus sets us free, walking in, living out the life, I don't have to slip around and, and hope nobody finds out and hope I don't get my cover blown. I don't have a cover, but I have become free by becoming a slave. I have not once looked back. I've not once gone back. Anyone that there's two things, anyone ever tells you that they know about me in sexual sin, they're a liar. And if they ever tell you they heard I paid retail, I know they're a liar. So <clears throat> we, uh, we have our freedom in our slavery. I am no longer a slave to sin. Most of you have never truly been set free from sin. And that's why it's so easy for you to go back to it. You need to ask Jesus today to set you free. Then we possess things. I got to hurry. Second Corinthians 6 and 10. He said, having nothing yet possessing all things. Well, that doesn't make any sense. 
It's a paradox. Then we know in 2 Corinthians 12 and 10, he said, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong and his strength is made perfect in my weakness. Another paradox. I'm doing all this to show you. I've shown you about 20 of them over the last two weeks. I could show you a lot more. For a 14-year-old girl to get pregnant out of wedlock and be told that she's highly favored of the Lord, that's a paradox. This thing's all about paradoxes. The Lord impressed me years ago. I was in a small group of people and the power of God moved very strongly. And I went away questioning, how could we have such a move of God with so few people? And it hit me very clearly. The Lord is, um, he is a paradox. He started in a manger, a sheep hovel, that stunk and was rotten. He was wrapped in the rags they'd used to wrap the teats of cows and goats. Stinking hellish place for God to come into the earth. Had to borrow a tomb. He who owned the whole earth created it by the word of his mouth. Had to borrow a tomb to be buried in. What a paradox. He owned everything, yet he had nothing. He borrowed things all the way through. He borrowed donkeys, borrowed a tomb, borrowed an upper room, borrowed a boat. All the way through, he was a borrower, and yet he owned everything. What a paradox. My strength is made perfect, and his, his strength is made perfect in my weakness. You want to be strong in the faith, strong in the power of God? Admit your weakness to him. <clears throat> then we triumph in our defeats. Oh my God, nobody likes this. Stop it. Don't say anymore. I don't like, you're confusing me. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verses seven through nine. Therefore, most gladly, most gladly, therefore I will glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I will take pleasure in my feeble mindedness. That's infirmities and reproaches when people treat me bad, persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Wow. Oh, what a mess this whole thing is, huh? If you're trying to figure it out in the natural, let me just get you one more paradox. The natural man can't even comprehend the things of God unless the Holy Spirit reveals them to him. We got nothing. And so... The Apostle Paul, just the warrior of warriors, he said, I gladly, gladly rejoice. Gladly, therefore, will I glory, glory in my infirmities. We glory in our feeble mindedness. And we know that <clears throat> when we don't even <clears throat> know how to pray, <clears throat> when we don't even know how to pray, he says, the spirit itself maketh intercession for us. And it's always in the will of God because he knows the mind of God because he is God. Oh, my goodness. Another paradox. Even when I don't even know how to pray or what to pray for, and I just sit confused and my mind is wandering. If I can step from that carnal world into that spirit world and allow him to flow through me, I love it. <clears throat> One translation says of Romans 8 that likewise the Spirit prays for our infirmities when we know not what to pray as we ought. It's somewhat of a picture word in the Greek of a person who's fallen into a well or a deep hole. And they're pinned down. Their arms are pinned. They can't have a plan. And that's something I get tired of since you brought it up. Of hearing people say, well, you just need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Maybe they lost their boots. Maybe they can't get off the narcotics or the drugs or the alcohol or the pornography. Maybe they need a touch of God to get it done. Or maybe you're a child of God and you've fallen in a hole and it's not a hole you dug for yourself, but you're down deep in that hole. And he literally says that 
that paraclete, that comforter. Will you hear you with groanings which cannot be uttered? And he will begin to effect your escape even if it means he has to tunnel down beside of you to make room for you to get out of that mess. So in my infirmities, I will therefore glory. For I know that we used to sing it. He will hear my feeble cry. He will answer by and by. When you feel a little prayer wheel turning, you will know a little fire is burning. Glory to God. Glory to God. Just a little talk to Jesus makes it right. And sometimes when I'm in a hole, the Holy Ghost himself digs down beside me and says, you okay? I said, I don't feel so okay. He said, you scared of the dark? I said, yes, and I don't like spiders and snakes. And I'm in a hole. And I can't seem to get out. And I don't know which way to go. And I don't know what to do. And my mind is tired. And I'm tired of trying to figure it all out. And I'm tired of trying to make it all make sense. He said, baby, it doesn't make sense. It's a paradox. He said, but you know what? I'm here with you forever. I will abide with you forever. And I know what the will of the Father is. And I know just exactly how to ask him. And so therefore, at my weakest, he is the strongest. At my most infirmed, he has the clear mind. And when I'm strung out and worried to a frazzle, like some of you are today, he knows exactly the hole you've fallen into, and he will come there. And then we know that we live by dying, and I've got to close with this. Apostle Paul said we are unknown and yet well-known, another paradox. He said as dying and yet behold we live, 2 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10. And we live as chastened and yet not killed and sorrowful yet always rejoicing as poor yet making many rich as having nothing yet possessing all things. One paradox after another. All this stuff. If you if you get down to it and you're trying to do the math, they don't come up. I'm sorry. I've been beat up, but I'm still here. They've forgotten about me, but I'm still hopefully well known in the courts of heaven. I've been through hell. They laughed at me. Somebody called me this week from Missouri and said they laugh about me saying I've been through hell. My back broke wearing gasoline drawers, but it's the truth. I know what this means. I live this. Then I think of that beautiful scripture in John chapter 12, verse 24 and 25. <clears throat> verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it died, it will bring forth much fruit. And he that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life will keep it unto life eternal. And then there's the greatest paradox to me of them all. Salvation is free. I understand Ephesians 2 and 8. I understand Romans 6. But then I also understand Luke 14. And Jesus said, if any man follow after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. And he's got to forsake everything and everybody to stay with me. And he said, count the cost before you start. Count the cost before you start. You've heard me tell the story again. It's been on my heart, so I want to tell it one more time. There's a lady and a gentleman, they went to Africa long, long years ago, 20s and 30s. And while they were in Africa, they were in the remote part of Africa, and it was just two couples there. And while they were there, uh, 
the demon-possessed chief of the village wouldn't let any one of his people talk to him, so they just were there. Mosquitoes were eating them up, and they were dying from malaria. And the only little boy they ever got to talk to was a little boy that sold them goat's milk. And so every when they the chief did allow him to sell them milk for their money, and he was the only person in the whole place they got to witness to. The woman got sick. She had a baby. She got sick and died right after. The husband became bitter, gave the child to the other missionary couple, went home, became a hopeless alcoholic, raised another family, never saw the little girl again till way late in life. The young lady's name was Aggie. And Aggie... Uh, came to America, the family came home and she was raised and she went to Bible school and married a preacher. And she was in a great conference one time. <clears throat> and the gentleman was speaking from that part of Africa and he was telling how there were 600,000 strong disciples in that part of the world. And she went up to him and she said, you know, I was born in your country. She said, I don't know very much about it. And she said, my mother and father went there. And my mother and father tried to be missionaries, but they were only able, he said, to talk to the goat milk boy. She said, yes. He said, I'm the presiding bishop over that part of the world now. He said, and we have a monument built to your mother. And he said, we're going to dedicate it in a few months, and I would like for you to come. And once you got there, the man took his text from John chapter 12, except a corner we fall into the ground and die. It'll die alone. But if it die, it'll bring forth much fruit. And save a flood became her was her mother's name, Swiss name. She came home from Africa and she went to see her alcoholic father and he wouldn't allow anybody to mention the name of Jesus. And he had his back turned to the wall when she walked in and she spoke his name. She said, Papa. And he said, Aggie. And he turned over. She said, I've come to tell you something. You don't have to be bitter. Mother didn't die in vain. And you didn't go to Africa for no reason. And Jesus wants to save you. And she told him the story of how one little boy was now in charge of 600,000. He went home and told the chief everything they told him. The chief was converted, the whole village, and it spread throughout that country. What a paradox. We look at it and say, what a waste for a young mother to die. God says, I know it doesn't make sense, but I know exactly what I'm doing. I've been through an awful lot. Some of you have been through an awful lot. Some of mine makes absolutely no sense to me or any of you. But I know that except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, It'll die alone. And I pray that this message, the last two weeks on paradoxes, bears much fruit. And I pray that all your pain will make sense someday, for let me explain it to you. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us in our light affliction, which worketh but for a moment worketh for a far more an unseen eternal weight of glory. <coughs> Father God, it doesn't make a lot of sense to us today, but could you begin to peel the veil back and show us what's really going on in this world? 
The Apostle John, Father, was busting rocks and thought his world had come to an end, but in the real world, praise had never ceased and the throne was still occupied and everything was right. And today for every bad diagnosis people have gotten or every rough day they've had, would you just do us a favor this morning and this afternoon and peel back the covers and let us see the throne is still occupied and praise is still taking place and the plan of God for each and every one of our lives is ticking right on time. And would you help us to quit looking around at the things around us and help us to see the unseen or it's the eternal part and make us like Moses where we would endure by seeing him who is invisible I love you. I thank you. I praise you. Thank you, Jesus. If you need somebody to talk to, 678-472-9494. Or you can email us at jubileeministries.org or you can write us at Jubilee Ministries, 5009 Lake Miriam Circle, Lakeland, Florida, 33813. We love you. I uh, I hope these last two weeks, though they're very different than what I normally do, are make, bringing some clarity to all of you. And just remember, keep your eyes on him that nobody else can see. And you will endure this thing. And he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. God bless you.